And next we have Gilad Lotan, who um, Ethan has already pointed out is a master coder, but he's also multi-talented. Um, so he works at Social Flow. Uh, additionally, he is also um, one of fairly few people who do something like that, who also publishes academic articles. Um, and also blogs at Global Voices, and I could go on and on, but in the interest of time, I'll let him take it. It's away. really great to be here. Uh, I'm going to go over a bunch of data points which I think are interesting and might help us uh, uh, take this conversation forward. So I'm Gilad. I'm a chief scientist at a startup called Social Flow in New York City. Uh, and I look at a lot of data um, in, my, in my daily routine. So we mine the full Twitter firehose, the full Bitly firehose. Uh, we build that into a product, but a lot of what I do is try to find out interesting things that we see in the data and tell stories from it. So lo and behold, humanity is fairly consistent. We talk about, we would mention mornings in the mornings, we get tired sort of towards the evenings, uh, talk about coffee more frequently in the morning. These are the sort of normal diurnal patterns that we see on Twitter, right, as expected. Uh, but it's actually, when, when when uh, interesting events happen, and events that are, are out of the ordinary that happen, it's very clear that they happen. So these are two very different trends on Twitter. Right? One is your typical uh, uh, hashtag that goes viral. So in this case, it's hash blame the Muslims. Starts uh, very locally uh, in London. It started right after uh, the events in Norway. Right? So instantly, sort of different Muslim organizations were blamed for what happened in Norway. Uh, actually, a, a Muslim uh, Twitter user in, uh, around London uh, started this hashtag and, and was saying, um, oh, you know, your, your clock is broken. Why don't you blame the Muslims? Oh, your, your car is not working? Uh, just blame the Muslims. And she and her friends, uh, I don't know what's happening here. Uh, she and her friends were, um, were sort of using the hashtag for snark. It sort of spread locally within their community, but died down at night. Uh, in the morning, total loss of context, spreads uh, uh, thoroughly on Twitter, uh, becomes globally trending, and then sort of dies down. All right, so we see an organic trend. We see it grow. We see loss of context. So that's interesting. Is that misinformation? It's people who saw this hashtag uh, and, are, and are thinking it's something very different, right? There, there are people who got really angry and said, how dare Twitter have this as trending? Like, this is not OK. Uh, but it started as a joke, a local joke spread and then dies down. That's totally organic. We see this all the time. What we see in green is uh, how a spam bot network uh, looks like. Right? So you, you see these steps happen. Right? It's as if someone's turning, on, turning a crank. They're like, OK, add more tweets. OK, 50,000 more tweets. More tweets. It, 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 then like, take them down. And what happens here, we suspect it sort of, uh, it, it somehow reached some organic growth. So it sort of started somehow growing in, in organic uh, traffic, Twitter, caught it, shut it down, and then it died. Right? So the stuff we could see, we, we could clearly see this kind of stuff uh, happening on Twitter just by looking at, at the uh, dynamics of like, the levels of data. Um, it's so easy to tell. Another thing that, that um, we could tell is, is throughout all these social signals. Uh, so we all know Justin Bieber and his screaming fans uh, on Twitter. This is sort of this is how much traffic he garners, how many retweets he gets in comparison to Pavel Globa who's probably the most retweeted person on Twitter, thousands and thousands and thousands of retweets, but we, d we never get to see him because his content looks, looks something like this, right? We see lots of eggs, we see sort of, I mean, he writes in Russian, he gets a ton of retweets. Uh, by the way, he predicted that um, the Mayans were not right, so 2012, we're safe. The world is not ending. He's getting a ton of retweets for that. Uh, uh, but, but obviously, the social structure of the network is not, and, and the way we sort of build our, our networks in these spaces uh, mean that we, like, we don't get to see a lot of this content because we wouldn't subscri subscribe to it. Um, this is another thing that, that we can get from looking at data. Uh, there's an analysis that we ran on uh, trending topics on Twitter. If you Google uh, Occupy Wall Street uh, trending topics, you'll, you'll see uh, a, a sort of better explanation for what this means. But in effect, when you actually look at the data and you see what, uh, uh, what topics are competing with, so levels of attention that Occupy Wall Street in blue is competing with like Kim Kardashian's wedding, right? Uh, Steve Jobs' death. You'll see that the way we build these algorithms, right? The, the way these algorithms promote certain trends to trending topics means we will never see anything that so, sort of slowly, slowly grows. Um, 
This is an interesting example of context setting, right? Another information flow. Uh, this is how the news about Osama bin Laden broke. Uh, so Keith Urban, uh, who used to be chief of staff for Don Donald Rumsfeld, wrote, he got off the phone. He's like, so I'm told by a reputable person they've killed Osama bin Laden. Right? He didn't have a huge following. He didn't have a huge network. But he had people who, who sort of set his post in context, who said, you know, Jake Sherman for Politico, Rumsfeld chief, says this. Brian Stelter of the New York Times also pointed to the fact that he used to be Rumsfeld's chief. Right? So with, without that context setting, we suspect the, the, the information wouldn't have spread as far. Right? That was a case of, of truthful information that spread, a rumor that spread really far. This is a case of uh, supposedly false information that spread quite far. Um, so we, at the height of Occupy Wall Street, Chopper, uh, uh, Chopper was told by, uh, supposedly told by New York uh, PD to move, that they're closing the airspace. Um, so NBC post posted this, sort of, it, it garnered a lot of responses, uh, and they had to retract it because uh, New York sort of, it, it's still unclear what exactly happened, but supposedly New York, PD, uh, New York Police Department uh, said that there, there was a, the pilot misunderstood what they were asking him, et cetera. So what we see with, when we actually look at the traffic, the green is the misinformation. So there's substantially more responses to the actual misinformation than, than the retraction of it, right? But this is not, um, this, this is not always the case. It's just the case uh, 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 for this specific uh, event. And there are actually all these issues with these events. But the, the, the more interesting question that we should be asking is, uh, first of all, what other, what other posts about the misinformation went out, right? Not the formal ones from uh, NBC. But also, who, who participated in, in the misinformation versus the information? And a lot of that we can get from the data. Um, so I, I think I'm going to stop here because we're running out of time. Um, and we'll continue the, the actual panel. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. You.